Welcome to Bible Insights with Wayne Conrad. God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Today's topic, the Christian Confession of God. The uniqueness and the glory of the Christian faith is it declares that there is only one God. But this God eternally exists in three personal centers of consciousness. That is, that God is a three-personed being. Notice I said being. I did not say three gods. I did not say three manifestations are just like the way God presents himself, but the way God is. God is a triune being. Now, the theological term that was coined in history for this unique biblical teaching of God is the Trinity. So Christians believe in the triune Yahweh, the self-existent, eternal God. But this God is the God of love, and he is the God of almighty power, the God of all wisdom, the God of all knowledge. He is the self-existent one. He is the holy, the eternal. He is God. Many people do not quite understand what Christians are affirming when they affirm the doctrine of God as Trinity. And in some ways, it's difficult for us to exactly say what we mean. And the reason is because there's no human analogy, no illustration that can actually give a completely accurate picture of this reality of God. And the reason for that is because God exists independent of his creation. So we attempt to explain the infinite God who exists above and beyond his creation, who is the cause of his creation, when we try to use creation images to describe him, we're basically trying to do something that's impossible. But we can, however, get some ideas from the way the Bible presents this great truth of God. Now, there was no one who sat down one day on a stone tablet somewhere and said, I think I'm going to come up with the greatest... uh, contradiction of a God that could ever be existing. And so he just sets out in human's imagination, comes up with some kind of concept of God as Trinity. There is no one who has this kind of concept except what's in the Bible. Because our efforts to create it ends up with either three separate gods or a chief God with some junior gods are a God who puts on a mask at different times, who acts in different ways, but still always just the one. God is one. Let this never escape from your thoughts. The one God, the God of biblical revelation, is one God. At the heart of the Christian doctrine of God is the Shema. That is the great confession of our of the greatest commandment we have and the greatest reality. The Shema found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, your God, is one Yahweh. You shall worship Yahweh, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And Jesus, in his statement of it, added, and with all your mind. Now, that brings up an interesting point, because yesterday, in the service of worship in the particular congregation of which I'm a member, we had an emphasis in preaching, in scripture reading, and in the singing and praying on the triune God, on God as Trinity. It's very important that churches proclaim their faith, It's not 
that we should do it only once in the life of a Christian. That is, they become a Christian, so we give them a discipleship course or a brief uh, little run-through of the doctrines of the church. That will never suffice. We must train our people in the great truths of the Christian faith, and these truths must be breathing out and being expressed constantly in our worship. Because the greatest form of discipleship that's taking place in any local congregation at any time is how they worship when they come together on the Lord's day or on the Sabbath day or on whatever day of the week they gather together for the public corporate worship of Almighty God. It's there that we need to be reading and singing and praying the great truths of our faith in a consistent manner. We need to constantly rehearse them so that we as a people of God can worship God in the fullness of his revelation, in the fullness of how he has declared himself to be. Well, the worship of yesterday inspires me to sort of share with you some brief looks into that kind of worship. We began worship with a statement that we're all very familiar with. It's known as the apostolic benediction, and many times it's pronounced at the end of the service. But we began the service with it yesterday. Uh, it began like this. God greets us. To his people, God gives this greeting. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now that's a good statement, a good blessing. It's a good word. That's what doxology is. It's a good word of praise that encapsules the great truth about God. Now you say, I don't see the word Trinity in there. No, you don't, but you do see Lord Jesus Christ, and you see God, and you see the Holy Spirit. And they're all on the equal plane. There's not one above and one below, and may there another one below him, or one above and two on an equal plane below him. They're on the same plane. The grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, but God gives us grace, the Father, and the Holy Spirit is a spirit of grace. So grace applies to all of God. He is the gracious God. But he greatly manifests his grace in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, in his incarnation and in his atoning death, followed by his glorious, victorious resurrection and ascension into heaven. The love of God, and Jesus loves us. The Holy Spirit loves us. Love belongs to the triune God because God is love, First John tells us. Now, how can be God be love before there was a creation? But the scriptures say that God is love. That means that it belongs to his eternal nature. He has always been love. Now, how can that be? Because love demands an object. It demands a subject. It demands communion. It demands fellowship. That's true because God exists. It's the three-personed God, the three-personed deity. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God in the fullness of his being, and the fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, be with us all. You see, fellowship, fellowship or communion is that interchange of life and ideas and affection, and activity. We do it on a human plane. We have fellowship with friends and with family. And we do it on the human divine plane by the enablement of the Holy Spirit through the mediatorial work of the Lord Jesus Christ who died so that our sin problem could be solved and we could have fellowship, a living relationship with God. So the worship began with this doxology, and it can also end with that doxology that's found in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. 
Let me give you another one. We stated at the beginning of the service this statement. It comes from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the commission of the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord, to his disciples that was given to them during the days of the 40 days in which he made an appearance to them between his resurrection and ascension. He met with them in a mountain on Galilee to which he had instructed them, and so they gathered with him there. Probably up to 500 Paul references this possibly in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says that at one time he manifested himself to 500 at once. This could definitely be that occasion. But he wants the 11 disciples to be with him and the others to come to join him and they meet him on this mountain. And here's an interesting statement. It says that when they saw him, they worshipped him. Now God is the only proper object of worship in the Bible. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Jesus said those statements, and he was quoting from Deuteronomy. We can only worship one God. And with those in the Bible, sometimes attempted to worship angels, they were forbidden to do so and said, stop. Even when they appeared to be so majestic as the one did in the book of Revelation, he said, stop. We can worship God We worship him on the throne. We worship the lamb who's on the throne with him. We worship God in the sevenfold spirit that flows out from his throne. But we can worship God only. But here, when the disciples saw Jesus, they worshiped him, but some doubted. They were sure not totally 100% certain Jesus had died. And here he is in risen glory upon a mountain. But this is what Jesus said to them when he came to them. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now tell me, all authority includes heaven where God is. So when Jesus says all authority in heaven has been given to him, he's talking about the authority that the Father gave him, that the Father shares with him, and that they share with the Spirit. It's the authority of God Almighty manifested here in the Messiah, the Christ, who is the king of God's kingdom. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. On the basis of this authority, go, or as you are going, disciple the nations. That's really the verb form. Disciple, make disciples of all nations. Really verbal form of discipling the nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, as we look at these words, consider the three-person God. All authority has been given to Jesus. He exercises the full authority. That's omnipotence. It's complete and utter sovereignty. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. On the basis of this, I want you to disciple the nations. And when you do so, they come to faith. You baptize them, dip them, immerse them in the name. He didn't say in the names. He's not making three gods. He said in the name, one name, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, the personal name of God in the Old Testament The covenant name is the name Yahweh. In early English translations, it was written out Jehovah, which we know is not the exact way it should be pronounced. Nevertheless, it's Yahweh, or if you want, you can say Jehovah. One God. But who is this God? That's the name of God in the Old Testament. Here's the name, basically, of God in the New. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That is God's name. He's the three-personed God. And so some in Christian traditions have begun service by saying, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Well, that name is Yahweh. The name is spelled out as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So here's two basic scriptures that tell us that God is triune. And it's on the basis of such scriptures, you see, that the Christians are compelled 
to acknowledge one God and Trinity of persons. Now that means that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are distinctions between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that the Father is not the Son, and the Spirit is not the Son. But the Father sends the Son, the Father sends the Spirit, the Spirit proceeds from the Father, Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Father. It's not talking about origin of being. It's talking about the reality of relationship that has always existed. There's never been a time when the Father was without the Son or they were without the Spirit. Now, there are other passages of Scripture that compel us to acknowledge God is the triune being. One of the most compelling is the words of Jesus himself in the Gospel of John when he's preparing his disciples for his soon crucifixion and followed by his glorious resurrection. And he starts promising them the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read this, but pay close attention to see if you can catch why we're compelled to say that God is triune. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that's counselor or paraclete, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps him, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. If any man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, And we will come to him and make our home with him. Now, did you catch this? Jesus says that we, that is the Father and me, the Son, we will come to him, the one who believes in Jesus, and we will make our home with him. This is called the mutual indwelling. You see, the Father and the Son and the Spirit, they mutually indwell one another. That means there is a relationship within God that's eternal that has these distinctions within him. And this is the God who comes to live within us. And how does he actually live within us? Not in the bodily form of the incarnate Son, but in the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, whom... Notice he says, whom, not it, whom the Father will send in my name. He, Jesus uses the pronoun. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. You see, what's interesting is that the Greek word for spirit is is neuter. But Jesus deliberately chooses the masculine pronoun he to refer to the spirit. Why? Because the Spirit is not simply an influence or a force. The Spirit is a person. He is the Lord. He is God. This is the Christian God. He is Father. He is Son. And He is Holy Spirit. This is the true God. And to know the true God in His Son, Jesus Christ, by the operation of the Holy Spirit, bringing us to new birth is eternal life. That's what Jesus said. This is eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, because he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. This has been Wayne Conrad with Bible Insights.